Once this problem was resolved, the president ordered the flow to begin of nearly $8 billion in Iran's frozen assets to the Bank of England. Right on, man. That's great. That's great. About $2.5 billion in Iranian assets held in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York started moving then by electronic transfer to the Bank of England, while another $5.5 billion was moving to London from American banks around the world. Once all that money was assembled in the Bank of England, the Central Bank of Algeria was notified that Iran's funds were all in escrow. Algeria notified Iran to that effect, and Iran began preparing the hostages for departure. They actually took off from Tehran Airport aboard two Algerian planes at 12.41 and 12.44 p.m. Washington time, shortly after President Reagan had been sworn in. Within minutes after the hostages were airborne out of Tehran, a Department of State party, including former Secretary Cyrus Vance, took off from Andrews Air Force Base for Wiesbaden, West Germany. Former Secretary of State Muskie, who had come to Andrews to see former President Carter depart for planes, talked briefly to reporters. But I gotta say to you, I've been dampening my emotions for so many months that it's hard for me to release them. Meantime, back here at the State Department, a lot of tense and tired people were beginning to unwind. At the Iran working group on the seventh floor, where officials and volunteers had held an around-the-clock communications vigil since the hostages were captured over 14 months ago, a celebration started. Special guests included the wives of two hostages, Louise Kennedy and Catherine Keogh. Tonight, the Iran working group disbands its mission accomplished. Back in Plains, Georgia, former President Jimmy Carter also expressed his thanks that the hostage crisis had ended. Early tomorrow morning, I will leave for Germany to welcome our hostages to freedom. And I know I will take with me the joy and the relief of our entire nation. Tomorrow, citizen Jimmy Carter is flying from planes to Wiesbaden, West Germany, as the guest of President Reagan, to welcome back to freedom the 52 American hostages who had dominated the last months, hours, and even minutes of his presidency. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News at the State Department. One unsolved mystery. Why did it take the Iranians six hours to release the hostages after assurance that their blocked assets had been transferred? The Algerian planes were at the airport. It was unconfirmed, but reportedly the hostages were there. Why that last agonizing delay? No answer yet tonight. Iranian Prime Minister Raja, in a Tehran radio broadcast today, reflected on the 14 and a half month long hostage crisis. And he said Iran's biggest achievement, as he put it, during that time was winning a new degree of self reliance. And he added that one day Iran, quote, will not have to depend on a foreign country for any reason. The foreign ministers of the 10 member European Common Market said today that with the release of the Americans, trade sanctions against Iran would be lifted. From Washington, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. The 40th President's inaugural day was one of double celebration, and President Reagan seemed pleased to share the limelight with the hostages. Bob Schieffer reports. The bells always signal Inauguration Day's traditional beginning, the church services. But as the Reagans returned from the morning services, the questions from the reporters were about events half a world away, the fate of the hostages. When did you last talk to President Carter? This morning, before went to the service. Can you share with us the comments? Yes, it was, he was before he informed me. The planes were on the, the end of the runway. The papers have been signed, the money has been escrowed. It was the question that Reagan would hear over and over, the question on everyone's mind, including Reagan's, the question that hung over this day, are the hostages safe? Are they really to be released at long last? There was still no answer as the Reagans met with the Carters at the White House. Well, I think the uh, intellectual and his wife will enjoy the new home. It was still unresolved as the motorcade to the Capitol was underway. The new president did not mention the hostages specifically in his inaugural address. He returned to the themes of his campaign, that the economy must be repaired and defenses strengthened. We must act today in order to preserve tomorrow. And let there be no misunderstanding. We are going to begin to act beginning today.
As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. He closed on an inspirational note as he told the story of Martin Treptow, a young soldier who was killed in France during World War I. We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. The crisis we're facing today does not require of us the kind of sacrifice that Martin Treptow and so many thousands of others were called upon to make. It does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and to believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much. As the cannon salute signaled the official transition of power, back at the White House, the trappings of power were already being changed. The old pictures came down, the new ones went up. Beneath the Capitol Dome, the president-elect sipped champagne and got right to fulfilling a campaign pledge. An immediate freeze on the hiring of civilian employees in the executive branch. There was a Capitol luncheon with congressional leaders, and by now, word was beginning to come out of Iran that at long last, the hostages were coming home. Thus, in his toast, the new president made the announcement that his predecessor had so hoped to make. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free of Iran. So we can all drink to this one, to all of us together, doing what we all know we can do to make this country what it should be, what it can be, what it always has been. On that joyful note, Ronald Reagan went to his parade. Jimmy Carter had surprised the nation by walking, but Mr. Reagan rode. And the parade that followed was, well, just the way inaugural parades are supposed to be. It was a lot of ceremony for one day, and there would be more tonight, but Mr. Reagan managed to squeeze in one bit of personal business. He tried out that chair in his new office. He likes it just fine, thanks. It's been a very wonderful day, and I guess now I can go back to California, can't I? It's all... <laughs> As darkness fell on this extraordinary day, the most spectacular fireworks show this Capitol has ever seen was set off on the mall. The new president didn't have to go out in the cold to see it. He had a perfect view from his new bedroom window. Bob Schieffer, CBS News, Washington. Shortly after the inaugural ceremony, former President Jimmy Carter took off for Georgia and a welcome home by his neighbors in Plains, as Lee Thornton reports. The former president described this day as one full of emotional experiences, dominated by news of the release of the hostages. Of the Andrews Air Force Base departure ceremony with its 21-gun salute and final review of troops, Mr. Carter said his heart was so filled with the realization of what it means to be free that he fought back tears. Before he took off for Georgia, there was a promise for hostage wife Anita Schaefer to convey her love to her husband when Mr. Carter travels to Germany tomorrow. The military aircraft that carried the former president away from Andrews was the plane that served as Air Force One. As an aide put it, the mood aboard was lots of emotion, one moment laughter, the next tears. They came from all around and stood in the rain to welcome the Carters back home to Plains with an outpouring of warmth and affection for a son of the South of whom they are proud. And Jim